appreciate it. Again, my name is Jessica. I work here at the uh, Great River of Visitor and Learning Center at Freedom Park. We do have bluebird boxes here, so I'm excited to learn more about how we can do a better job of supporting our bluebirds, our eastern bluebirds. We put them up, and we were pretty careful about how we put them up. We, you know, had the Peterson-style nest boxes in the first year. I think we had some good success, and every year after that has been a struggle. So I'm so excited to have the experts here, Mr. Lowell Peterson, Jim Higgins, Jim Bikes over right. there um, from the Bluebird um, Restoration Association. Yes, Restoration of Association of Wisconsin. So many -A -A acronyms floating yeah. through my brain right now. Yep. So thank you. We're really excited to have you here. And thank you for being willing to share your knowledge with us because we have a lot of people who want to help support our Bluebird populations as well. Oh, thank you, Jessica. And thank you for all coming. This is such a beautiful facility here that we have. We just had our annual meeting yesterday over at uh, near Eau Claire at the Beaver Creek Preserve. And three of us were there and they put on a nice program there. So they do have an annual meeting. I'm uh, been a, about a 25 year member of the Bluebird organization. And I know Jim has been a long time member. And both Jim's. I'm, I'm a newbie, I've only been, I think, member for about four or five years. So I've been uh, working with Bluebirds for about, uh, I think I've put up nest boxes for at least 28 years. And I'm not even sure exactly why, but I saw an article in a local newspaper of a presentation. So I went up there and I found out about bluebirds and uh, joined. Anyway, what we're going to do today is talk about cavity nesting birds. And we have more than just bluebirds as cavity nesters. And uh, they have a purpose here too. And they're native, a lot of them are native to Wisconsin, the one we're going to talk about. But uh, people love bluebirds. They just you know, just kind of really do enjoy them. And I know probably all of you, or most of you, uh, have seen bluebirds. And I got a little toy here, and if you listen carefully, mm -hmm. isn't it amazing mm -hmm. how they can duplicate that? And that's exactly, I put on presentations like this to uh, fourth and fifth grade elementary kids. And I've been doing that for about 15 years. And uh, I tell you that the kids, it's, it's just fabulous. A fourth and fifth grade are just great to work with. Some of the other cavity nesting birds, most of you maybe flickers, woodpecker family, kind of interesting. They help, uh, they help us build cavities, these birds. And uh, of course, uh, I don't know how many of you know about this one. It's a red-headed woodpecker. When I was a uh, six and seven, eight, ten years. I lived on a farm. I remember these little birds all over the place, red, red-headed woodpeckers. I've, the last one I've seen about five years ago, and they're just not very common now, at least they're around some so. mm -hmm. And of course, chickadees. Chickadees are cavity nesters also. And uh, so we have uh, fortunate uh, situations here. What I'm gonna do is start this little wooden one out, and I'll just start it out here with this young lady right here, and she can pass it around. But it gives you an idea of what they look like. That's a male there. What we're going to do is show some slides. We've got about 25 slides, so we'll go through those slides, and we'll talk a little bit about each slide. And uh, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to raise your hand. We'll very informal, and we want to try to answer the questions as we go. And I have uh, the two gyms here to kind of help us out. They've got some excellent props, and uh, you can see some nest boxes here. Um, so what we're going to do is get rolling, and I brought a nest box here too. And so we're going to get kind of rolling here. Unfortunately, I don't have a remote, so I've got to operate this old projector right from the uh, back here. Uh, people ask me, well, what kind of nest boxes are the best ones? And I always say, well, the best nest boxes are ones that have bluebirds in them. But uh, bluebirds are real fussy on the style. I mean, uh, when they're ready to nest, which uh, hopefully here in the next week or two with the removal of some of our snow, we're going to see some bluebirds around. And when they are about ready to nest, they will find a spot to nest. And it doesn't have to be a particular design box. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about what makes a good box for bluebirds and maybe the other cabinet masters too. So, 
A lot of people take pride in designing nest boxes, and uh, sometimes they're all different, but most times you can get the wrong one. Okay, uh, bluebirds uh, are insect eaters, and uh, because of that, they like to nest in an open area. So an ideal spot is uh, kind of like a pasture land, a golf course. A lot of people put nest boxes up on golf courses. Uh, if you have a backyard that has a fairly open area, uh, excellent, excellent. And uh, this particular nest box, you'll notice, is on a wooden post. We don't uh, recommend that any longer, and mainly uh, because of predators. And the main one is probably uh, predators that climb wooden posts, such as a raccoon, cats, and so forth. So what we recommend uh, is you always try to protect the nest box. And uh, we use PVC. Some people use like stove pipes over a post. It's very difficult for these predators to climb up there because they love to eat the eggs. Yeah. And uh, cats will, uh, uh, their predators are very dangerous predators, actually. But we'll talk about that. As, uh, we've got more to talk about the predators. And there's, here's another different style nest box. Again, it's on a wooden post. But you'll notice the habitat here is pretty ideal. It's open. And uh, some people will ask, uh, well, what happened to our bluebirds? Why don't we have very many bluebirds? About 25 years ago, 28 years ago actually, the Bluebird Association was formed. And so it happened yesterday, the first president of RA was at our annual meeting. And he happened to live in New Richmond right now. He worked with the DNR and they got together and determined that if they could create some cavities, maybe they could attract birds. Wisconsin, is the number one producing bluebird state in the United States. It used to be Nebraska, but about three or four years ago, Wisconsin dethroned uh, Nebraska. So we're now the number one bluebird producing state. And it's because of a lot of dedicated people. I mean, they're just a lot of dedicated people that uh, spend time. One of the other problems that uh, bluebirds faced was again the habitat, and being that they were cavity nesters, they typically do not make their own cavity. They relied on these guys here, woodpeckers, to make the cavities. And woodpeckers will not use the same cavity two years in a row. Isn't that kind of interesting? Yeah. Wow. How nature takes mm -hmm. care of our friends. And so, the bluebirds will take over the nest box. Well, they used to make, uh, Jim is going to show that post right there. Look at that. Wooden posts. Farmers used to use wooden posts in their fields. Now what? Uh, steel posts. Very difficult. So we lost the habitat. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening in our environment, really, in a lot of cases where our animal numbers are decreasing is because of habitat loss. So anyway, these wise people 28 years ago said, let's build some nest boxes. So that's where uh, they came up with the idea. And uh, they learned a lot of things. Here's an ideal spot. You'll notice it's on a steel post. Excellent. It would be better even if it had a piece of uh, PVC pipe around it. But it's very difficult for a raccoon to climb a steel fence post. But they can do it. Believe me, they can do it. How high should it go? How high? Good question. She wants to know how high. Well, I've learned by watching, actually, and also I've read, cats can jump from the ground straight up five feet. Cats are an amazing animal. And if they can get one claw into this wood, they'll pull themselves up. And. Uh, I happen to have a female cat, she's no longer alive, but I did have a cat, and she would get outside now and then. And one day I was out there, she was sitting below the nest box, and she was looking up there, and she jumped up, and it wasn't quite five feet. She got up there. Well, I immediately 
moved that box up another foot higher so that she couldn't get out of it. Yes, ma'am. I can remember when I lived in River Falls, walking down the hill, and my daughter's cat, big as it was, was crouched on the top of a neighbor's bluebird house, and then looked like Snoopy, you know, looking at him. I just went over and picked him up. <laughs> well, there, yeah. Oh, and he was terrible. I've seen pictures of him sitting on top of the house. Yeah. Like said. Then the male bluebird will dive down on him to try to chase him away, and of course, they try to. Well, I couldn't believe how you could sit, a, and it was a pretty high one too. Oh I yeah, was, they're ooh. they're amazing. Cats are an amazing animal. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Inch and a half diameter is what we recommend, and that uh, that's this particular box right here. That's an inch and a half. I make uh, and Jim, uh, you've seen, you've got a couple of S boxes here. They have a kind of an oval hole. And if we use an oval hole, then people will ask me, well, is an oval hole better than a round hole? I have got good luck with both. I think sometimes the, the oval hole looks a little nicer in a sense. It's a little more, uh, I guess. But then you want to make the hole a little bit narrower, not quite as wide. Because if it gets a little bit too big, then you get the other birds that are competition for the bluebird. That's the eastern bluebird. That's the kind of uh, bluebirds that we have here in Wisconsin, Minnesota. Uh, there's actually three kinds of bluebirds. There's the eastern that we have. There's the western that's more out in the, obviously, the western part of the United States. And then the mountain bluebird. Beautiful bluebirds. Um, there's the, the male on the right and the female on the left. They will typically be coming, hopefully, here within a week or two. I've seen two already, but uh, boy, with this snow that we've been having and stuff. Because, <laughs> as I say, they are insect eaters. I just uh, was out checking my nest boxes here. I've got 33 nest boxes uh, in a little prairie preserve along the township roads near my home. And uh, one of the nest boxes, as I, was op I opened it up, and uh, there were three adult dead bluebirds in there. Oh. And so the only thing I could figure out is that they stayed here uh, in December. It got pretty cold. I remember back in January, December, there was some pretty hefty wind chills. And what was interesting is that there were a lot of uh, sumac seeds in the nest box. And sumac seeds are food for them in the wintertime, as well as um, crab apples. So they prefer, obviously preferred uh, insects, but uh, in December, January around here, we're not going to find it. I was uh, walking my dog here a couple years ago and uh, happened to be walking along and I noticed up on the power line there were two adult birds, male and female, and three, what I felt were a little bit smaller, so I assumed they were the young ones. And it was in January, January 10th, I remember the date, Ooh. because I thought, oh, dear. They're predicting some snow in the next couple of days. And don't you know, we got about six inches of snow. And of course, after snowfall, the temperature goes like this. And I thought, oh, boy, there are going to be five bluebirds that aren't going to make it. Well, a week later, I was walking in the same area. I saw three of them. So three of them at least made it, but of that five. I always leave my nest boxes up in the winter time, and I keep the door closed, mainly because of some of these late comers or late stayers. They don't want to migrate. I used to water, put out a warm water brew bath in the winter time, and one of our members of the Brow organization said, you know, that might not be the best idea, because if the warm water keeps these birds around in November, December, Know what's going to happen? They're not going to have food. So it's kind of a you kind of say, well, gee, they're going to stay anyway, aren't they? Well, maybe, but if you're going to attract them by keeping warm water, it might not be the best idea. So I discontinued it, but I do keep my nest boxes closed. This is uh, another bluebird. It's not the eastern. Is it? This is the mountain one. Yeah, this is the mountain. I can never remember which one. It is. 
And you'll notice he's sitting there on the cavity too. Another beautiful bird. Just a little bit different coloration, about the same size. I was out in the Black Hills a few years ago and I did see uh, a bluebird. Uh, here's bluebird. Uh, they have a rather interesting way. You'd say, how can they hang on there? Well, with their claws, they can basically grab on here. And you'll notice I put a little saw curve, and a lot of people do. They put a little saw cut right in the wood, and that helps them, you know, hang on. And I always tease the members of uh, Bra. I said, you know, you guys, you think you're so smart. What did these boards do before humans started building nest boxes? <laughs> so when you really think about it, we think we're so smart, we're going to help them do all these things. Somehow they made it, right? And there were obviously a lot of bluebirds probably 100 years ago or so. It would mean we would have a time once. So we tease each other all the time about, uh, hey, we don't have to be so smart. You know, they, they'll take care of themselves. Mealworms. Uh, we talked about uh, insects, and I think a uh, lady here mentioned that she does feed some worms to the bluebirds. And uh, I've got a couple stories on this one. I put on a presentation uh, at the Fish and Wildlife Service over by New Richmond, and I had uh, 35 people there that night. And afterwards, a gentleman came up to me with the Birds and Bloops magazine. Maybe some of you have seen it. He flipped open page 16, I remember that. And there was a picture of a human hand, three young bluebirds eating mealworms out of the palm of his hand. So he says, that's my hand. I said, well, how did you, how long did it take you to, before you got those bluebirds to come into your hand? He said, well, I had, uh, I stood out of my deck. And he said, the adults would kind of come close, but they were afraid of me. But the young ones were not. And he said, within a few days, he had those young ones eating out of his hand. So it's pretty remarkable. So. You know, bluebirds, I, I have uh, put on presentations, I mentioned to uh, a lot of elementary age kids, fourth and fifth grades. And uh, <clears throat> these kids always tell me, uh, well, we can't touch them, can we? You know, they want to, I said, well, you know, bluebirds like people. They get along real well with humans. And uh, I tell them a story about my wife and I were out checking my nest boxes one day. And the nest box was laying on the ground. It was early in the season, right? So I thought, what happened to this? So I opened it up, and there were four babies. They were probably two or three days old, no feathers yet. And it was cold day. And uh, they were so stiff and cold, they were just barely, barely moving. And actually, one was dead. So uh, I suggested to my wife, I said, why don't you take them, put them in the palm of your hand and massage them and see if you can warm them? I'm going to rebuild the nest. We'll put it back up and see what happens. So I did that. We put the little babies back in there, the three live ones. I went back an hour later. The adults were there, and they were feeding those three. And we did fledge. Fledge means that they leave the nest box. So we did fledge those three babies. And it was after she had, you know, used uh, her hands to warm them. So, cavity nesting birds cannot smell. Think about that. How does Mother Nature do that? Well, if you think about five or six little babies in this nest box for two weeks, and uh, doing all the things that little babies have to do when they grow up, right? You can imagine that uh, the order in there is probably not that great. Bluebirds are very good baby, uh, Nest, uh, they keep their house very clean. They're very good housekeepers. A couple of their competitors, the tree swallows and so forth, are not quite as good. But uh, I always say, well, part of the reason for that is bluebirds will nest more than once, usually. Again, here's Mother Nature. And Mother Nature takes care of because there's high predation rate amongst bluebirds, very high predation. So anyway, they... Uh, uh, seem to get along with humans quite well. So these little kids, you know, they'll say, well, can we look in there? And, you know, we, we do take the key out and just open it. And the, that 
that's part of the fun. I put on these presentations and then they have bluebird trails on the campuses of the schools. And we have many, many schools in Wisconsin that are doing this. We have uh, up at Somerset, I've got two schools up there that put out bluebird boxes. They have one nest box that's about 15 feet outside the classroom window. And you can imagine what's going on there when the kids are trying to do their arithmetic. They're going to be watching any birds out there. <laughs> so they have a good time with it. Can I ask you about your house? You got a board in there. Yeah. Yeah, well, the reason I put that in there is because it's a little shim. When I put this nest box, this happens to be just a wooden post that I've got oh, that set okay. If I put that on that blue T post or green T post that I showed you before, with the PVC, uh, it'll spin a little bit in the wind. So I just put that little shim up there to keep that nest box from spinning. Yeah, because like thinking, how would the birds live with that? Yeah, yeah, that that just okay, I just I, I brought along to show you that I do that too. Okay. Yes. How long did it take? How long to make this house? Well, I've made quite a few of them, so I can make them pretty fast. What I sometimes do, I'll cut out five or six of the same piece of my workshop. I've got a workshop with saws and all that. And I'll cut them out, and, uh, and then when I get them all cut out, then I assemble them. And I've learned over the years, I used to make them with, uh, I used nails. Very, very bad idea. Uh, nails will tend to rust a little bit in there, and uh, every once in a while, our little woodpecker friends come along, and they say, you know, that hole is kind of small. I'm going to make that hole bigger. So they'll end up enlarging the size of the uh, entrance hole. Mm. And of course, then we're inviting predators, right? But uh, if I see that happening, I because I have two uh, screws at the bottom of the door for hinges. And very easy to remove the screws, bring another entrance door, put it in. Five minutes, I'm on my way. And I got a new door and so forth. And uh, if you should happen to, I use cedar wood. I recommend if you are going to make your own nest boxes, use cedar. It's a little more expensive, but um, it will last longer, definitely. And I've had bears go in and uh, just shred them. You know, bears, uh, we've got bears up there, you know, maybe around here too. But they'll come in and, you know, they'll just destroy that box in five minutes. So some of it I can salvage, uh, sometimes you can't. So you just replace it. Talking about mealworms, you know, we talked about the gentleman had. Uh, so if you want to uh, feed mealworms, they will definitely eat them. Um, I tried to, I had uh, a little saucer I put down at the foot of the nest box and I had some mealworms in there and boy, I went back the next day, the mealworms were all gone. I said, gee, look at that. They're really eating my mealworms. So I did a couple of days of that and I thought, you know, I haven't seen the, those bluebirds actually eating the mealworms. So I put some mealworm back in the saucer and I backed off. Uh, 20 feet away, and I just stood there. All of a sudden, here comes a bunch of ants, yeah. and they were eating the mealworms. Oh, <laughs> so. What about those dehydrated mealworms? Uh, I think they're a lot less expensive than the live ones, yeah. and they do eat them. I think mm -hmm. you, you use the dried well, ones. I think if you start out right away in the spring, uh, there isn't a lot of other stuff. I think they're more apt to take the dry ones. Uh -huh. But yeah. I, I make my own suet and mix that with it too, and then they like the suet too. Oh, they like suet? Certain, certain suet. I have a recipe that I use. Um, here's uh, the nesting uh, process. First of all, the uh, male and the female will uh, kind of, the male will whistle a little bit, trying to get the females around there, and then they, uh, they'll make a nest. They'll make a nest together, actually. And they make a beautiful little nest. I've got uh, some little props over here, and uh, I don't know if uh, we can just kind of pass this around, too. Uh, that gives you an idea what a bluebird nest will look like. It looks just like the slide. 
And uh, they will lay usually five eggs on the first nesting. And of course, it's a beautiful blue egg, small egg. And uh, the process then is uh, the incubation. And the female is the one that will sit on the nest. And it takes about uh, oh, 14, 15, 16 days before they will hatch. And uh, once they hatch, um, they're not very big. But after th these little guys here are probably about 12 days old. They need to have about 16 days of growth before they're ready to fledge. And like I said, fledging means they're going to basically leave home. And when I put on my little presentations to the children, the students, I always say, well, how old are you folks? You know, Are you nine or 10? Yeah. I say, how many of you still live at home? <laughs> and they look at me with this big look, you know. I say, well, you know, these little birds, 16 days and they leave home. Isn't that amazing? You know, they think, then they can relate to how quickly the cycle is. And then uh, Lowell Peterson comes, yes ma'am? How long is their life cycle? Well, we just learned yesterday, it's not long. The average bluebird I read lives about 1.1 or 1.2 years. I had lunch yesterday with a lady that was banding bluebirds. She had permission to band them. She's had one that's been coming back, it's a male, for eight years, she said. If he comes back two more years, that'll be the longest period of time that they've ever had the same bluebird come back. So that's pretty interesting. But we're talking about life cycle. 16 days, they fledge. They're on their own. Old Peterson comes along, he opens up the nest box, and there's a nest in there. I wanted to remove that nest. So I, I cleaned it out. And like I said, bluebirds are pretty good housekeepers, so they're not too bad, but uh, we're talking about tree swallows, they're not so good. And uh, so I'll remove the nest, walk away, and come back uh, a few days later, two or three days later, they will have had either a nest completed or well on their way. And the female will lay some more eggs. And most times in the second nesting, they'll probably lay four, but sometimes not. Do they reuse a nest if you don't clean it up? Well, they will, but they'll build a new nest over the top of the old one. And the reason we like to have them re uh, remove the nest, let's just say that first nest is about this high. If they build a second nest, it's going to be about this high. When these little guys are about 12 days old like this, they can peek out and see what this world is all about. And if they should happen to come out and they can't fly, goodbye. You know, it's, they're really uh, predation will take them over. So it's uh, a lot of uh, Mother Nature takes care of that by having double nestings and even triple nestings. I've had not as many as maybe some of you guys have had, but I've had uh, probably in the last several years, maybe four or five times I've actually had triple nesting. And I've had, uh, I think I counted 14 eggs in one year. So when you think about that, that female's working pretty darn hard. And so the male, they both will feed those babies. So they've got to go through that cycle three times. They deserve a little rest when they're done, believe me. <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, but Mother Nature, I tell you, it's, uh, I learned something, I've been doing this for many years, and I swear I learned something every year, something that I didn't have happened before. You know, I just, uh, it's so interesting. And, uh, working with the young kids, you know, they, they really learn a lot with it too. Okay, we're gonna talk about tree swallows. Tree swallows are also cavity nesting birds. They compete with new birds for the same nest box. And uh, tree swallows are native. They come to Wisconsin. They are beautiful birds, and they eat a lot of mosquitoes. I have uh, 31 nest boxes at Willow uh, River State Park, and uh, because there's a lot of water there, they have a, a lot of uh, tree swallows there. 
The one issue that uh, Bluebird people don't like, the Bluebirds will come back a week or two before the tree spawns. And a lot of times they'll actually have a house selected, a nest probably started, and maybe even completed. The tree swallows will come in and move them out. And I mean, uh, sometimes it takes more than one, but they will gang up on the male bluebird because he's trying to defend the nest. And they will, I've seen them on the ground, just beating each other with their wings and everything. But sometimes the bluebird will win out. Sometimes the tree swallows, probably more often than not, the tree swallows will take over. Had them where they wolf, must I open up the box and there's a dead bluebird and there's a dead tree swallow. So it's right? a battle royale. Yeah, and they will fight it out. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, Mother Nature is, uh, you know, the answer to that is hey, let's make some more nest boxes. That's what we say in uh, mm -hmm. the Bluebird Association. Are the swallows more common around water? Yes, mm -hmm. at least I, I found that to be true. They say, well, uh, Tree swallow will go about two and a half miles or three miles for mosquitoes, and that's primarily where they're responsible. Do you pair up the boxes? Yeah. Yeah. Pardon me? Do you pair them up? So that well, that's an argument that uh, the Bluebird Association has had for many years. Um, the question was about pairing nest boxes. And it used to be a very common thing that if uh, you put maybe 20 feet away. I guess I didn't say how far apart to keep them. But if keeping them about 20 feet away apart, that was what we call pairing. And so the tree swallows would take one nest box, the bluebirds would take them the other. I used to do that. We had a gentleman by the name of uh, Joel Heller, lived down in uh, southern Wisconsin. He was our statistician. He, uh, we re we would recommend that all members of the Bluebird Association send in results from their monitoring of the nest boxes. And Joel summarized a lot of things about, uh, one of the questions was, are you one of the people that pair the nest boxes? And he determined that by pairing, we actually get less bluebirds than if we separated them by 300 feet. That's a recommended minimum distance. How many? 300? 300. 300. So it's, if you have a backyard, unless you have five or six acres of land, it's hard to get too many nest boxes in there close to them. So, um, and bluebirds are territorial, so when they pick out a house, they're going to defend a certain amount. Okay. You know? Yeah, they're, they're, they all respect their own property. You know, if the bluebird is in there first, he's going to fight for it. But again, at Willow River, with a lot of tree swallows, I've seen four or five tree swallows diving on one bluebird male. And I mean, they just drive him crazy. He just has to get out of there. So if you know, they get out. How, but how, the beauty, how, yes. Sorry, how many bluebirds, can you put bluebird boxes near another bluebird box? Well, that's a, that's a question that we have. If you do, the two bluebirds are just going to battle each other. They're very territorial. They're not like martins, you know, the house martins where they were community birds. But they're, they'll defend their area. So we recommend, like I say, about a football field. Mm -hmm. Not always easy to do. I've got a lot of my nest boxes I put on town roads out along uh, my, my area there up in Somerset. Here's the eggs that a tree swallow uh, lays. They're white eggs, usually uh, six eggs. They will nest one time. So when they are fledged, and the, the cycle is about the same length, about 15, 16 days for the uh, hatching, the incubation period, and then the feeding works about the same. One of the interesting things about tree swallows is that uh, they will make their nest and they will always line it with feathers. And they will find turkey feathers, chicken feathers, and I'm not sure where the other feathers come from. But they always tend to line their nests. Yeah. They are not good housekeepers. And that's probably because they know they're not going to use that house again. So it gets very, very messy in there. I always tell my little students, I say, well, when you guys are there to um, clean out the nest box, make sure you're not downwind. 
you know, mm -hmm. because uh, there's nasties in there. There may be lice and, uh, you know, other things. So make sure you're always upwind when you're out the nest box. I did, I learned that by the yeah. yes. You said the bluebirds nest more often, so once the swallow, they're out of there, will the bluebirds come back? Exactly. Okay. The question was, what happens after the uh, tree swallows have fledged? And I come along and clean it out, right? And two or three, four days later, bluebirds will take it over, and they do. So, and then the tree swallows don't uh, interfere with them. It works out pretty well. Do you see more of that so, aggressive? Yeah, question. So you see more of that aggressive um, behavior in the early spring than yes. later? Yes. Yeah. Once they nest the first time, the they're, movements they're, they're, they're are okay. So if you see the start of a tree swallow nest in a bluebird box, do you, des do you destroy that nest? No. No? I mean, uh, because yeah. tree swallows are desirable too. Absolutely. I, I love tree swallows. They're beautiful. You know, you mm -hmm. saw that other slide there. They're beautiful birds. And uh, they soar like uh, mm -hmm. martins. Mm -hmm. They're smaller mm -hmm. than martins, yeah. but they, they look a lot like martins. And they're protected birds. Wisconsin does not want us to destroy any of these nests. We're going to talk about another bird that really is a controversial bird when it comes to uh, <coughs> this little guy. House wrens. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh. They're they're Which small, very small, very aggressive little guys. I've seen these go after blue jays, which are probably four times larger, oh, yeah. and they'll chase the blue jays away. And uh, protect the birds. The interesting thing about house wrens, the male is the one that makes the uh, nest. They make their nests out of sticks. I remember yeah. Everybody see those sticks? Mm -hmm. oh, as a kid. And uh, I have uh, several nest boxes in my yard, and I intend to catch a few house wrens to come in, and they will make their they'll fill that box right up to here with sticks. The female comes along, and she says, "Hmm, he's done some pretty good work." I'm going to check out all these nest boxes. So if I got four nest boxes in my yard, she'll check them all out. She'll find one she likes, and she will line her nest. Um, I guess it's going around. Uh, she'll line the nest, all these sticks in there. I, I got a slide. Why not? Here's the sticks. You can't see it real well. But look at all these little sticks in here. But she will line that little cup in there with grass and then she will lay her eggs in there and these are red eggs and you'll see there's about eight of them there very tiny ones are probably the size of your little fingernail but again the cycle is pretty much the same and uh, I always, that cup is only about yay big and when you get eight eggs in there and eight little babies that gets pretty crowded but they do it and uh, I have uh, an ornamental nest box <clears throat> by my patio. And I had it on the railing of uh, the patio, it was about this high up. My wife and I like to go out for coffee at about 6 o'clock in the morning and sit there and enjoy the birds and hear the sounds and all that. We live out in the country. But anyway, we're there one day and all of a sudden this male wren is sitting on the post, and maybe some of you experienced that. He just a chattering up a storm. <laughs> And he did not want us there very bad. So we just said, well, we're here first. We're going to stay here. And so after about three or four days, he determined that maybe they're not going to hurt me. So they kind of ignored us. It wasn't long before the female actually laid eggs, eight eggs in that nest box. So one day we're out there having our coffee. This is about two weeks, of, or actually it was about maybe uh, four weeks. And I just happened to look over there, and here's a little head popping up. <laughs> so one of the little reds were peeking out, and I thought, uh oh, I said to my wife, I said, look at that. I said, I wouldn't be surprised tomorrow they're going to fledge. And so the next day, boy, we were excited because we were going to watch this happening. You know? In about an hour's time, all eight of them had fledged. It was amazing. I mean, here are these little guys come popping out of here and just flying away. Just saw the light.
And wrens are pretty right. small to begin with, so yeah. those babies oh, yeah. must have been. Yeah. Oh, they're little tiny things. Yeah, they're very tiny. Oh. Yeah. Predators. We talked about the PVC pipe. Well, this guy here, you all don't recognize him. <laughs> and uh, raccoons are amazing animals. Very intelligent. Their paws are very, very much like our hands. They, they almost have a thumb. They can climb very well. And uh, we had a gentleman down by the cross that uh, had cameras. They, they were really trying to figure out what's going on there with these uh, raccoons. And they put the PVC pipe. And uh, so anyway, one night, raccoon came in, put the big hug on the post, and he shimmied up the post. Can you imagine that? No. And they got up there on top. It's you know, it's, so how do you beat this? Grease well, I know post. some people put uh, oil, yeah, uh, yeah. wax, car yes. wax, and different things on it. Oh. Uh, we had a fellow talk about putting wrapping barbed wire around it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I don't know, would that hurt him? I think that would just help him climb. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, some of them use these uh, shims too, or big uh, shields. Slinkies work for squirrels. You know, the old-fashioned sleep. It could be. I mean, you know, try almost, if you have, I don't have, personally, I don't have raccoon trouble. Oh. And mainly because uh, I had a dog <coughs> in my yard quite a bit. And, uh, raccoon did dog when they wanted to left, so I didn't have any problem with the raccoons. You can't see the slide too well, but here's another That's major predator. Mm -hmm. Um, the DNR estimates that uh, 3 million birds a year are killed by oh. feral cats. So if any of us do have cats, try to keep them indoors if you can. I know it's tough, but... And they are re remarkable animals, so we all know that. And they will get up there if they can. We talked about house sparrows. There was a lot of discussion yesterday at our annual meeting about house sparrows. And uh, this is the English sparrow, brought over here in sometime between 1860 and 1880, I believe, from Europe to combat the bull weevil. And uh, this particular bird is the most numerous bird in the world at this time. What? It's the most numerous bird in the world. I was in Nepal about 20 years ago, up in the mountains, 11,000 feet elevation. There were sparrows there. So they're all over. But look at a, I, I, they're actually uh, the finch family. If you look at their beak, very heavy beak, like the cardinal, you know, finches, they use that beak like a weapon. And uh, they will kill uh, bluebirds and other cavity nested birds. They're not protected birds. They're not native to North America. So, we have a lot of discussion about that, especially in my house. Uh, I, I always say, well, there's a blue sparrow nesting in there, and I want to tear out the nest. Um, <clears throat> well, as long as there are not babies in there, it's okay. But my wife would probably uh, have paper served on me the next day. But, <laughs> she, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, a lot of people will uh, destroy uh, sparrows, and there's different ways. Uh, Jim, did you have that one? Uh, we found out, or gentlemen found out, uh, that uh, we call it the K box. You can talk about it, Jim, and tell them what you think about that. Well, sparrows, when they build a nest, instead of building a grass cup, they put a roof on it. So they got grass over the top when they're in there. And so people thought about, what's that about? Is that does that mean they don't want a lot of light to come down on them when they're in there? So uh, this box uh, was designed by a guy in Kentucky. I think his name is Wayne Davis. But instead of a hole, he made a slot. The bluebirds have used this, and the squirrels don't like it because there's so much light coming in. Oh. And then this is a variation of that. This is instead of a hole, uh, they extend the opening all the way to the roof. A little more lighted. I uh, have some nest boxes and uh, golf courses around River Falls, and there's a lot of sparrows there. And one golf course, I got all my boxes are like this. 
happened uh, two summers ago. I had a female bluebird sitting on her eggs and she died there because the sparrows came in and kept pecking on her head. Aww. And she had these babies underneath her. She was trying to keep, keep warm and they were all dead. Aww. So I brought it home and showed my wife. But, so at this golf course, I have all these and they work pretty well to keep the sparrows out. And so the, the principle of letting a lot of light in uh, works for these house sparrows. They're, they're not a native bird and if I their nest is messy, it's full of cigarette wrappers and all kinds of stuff. Oh. It just doesn't look natural. So I, they're not a native bird, so if I even see eggs in there, I can legally destroy it, which is what I do for house sparrow nests. I just clean it out if there's one egg or there's four. I know what it is, it's a messy nest and I just clean it out. The starling is another bird that's around farms and so on. That's also a, a non-native species and you can aggressively go after it. It's not protected by any tree or law. So these work pretty pretty well for me. And there are other people who uh, we had a, yesterday at a meeting and there used to be a guy over by Green Bay when the Boober organization got started. He thought about all the fence posts he saw that movers were using, and a lot of them had wooden fence posts. The top was rotted out of the fence posts, and then the woodpecker went through the side and made a cavity. So these bluebirds were in this, these wooden fence posts with an open roof. They were successfully raising young, and so this uh, Boudre, Boudreau, no. he, he was making nest boxes like this, they're a little taller, more like a fence post. He deliberately put a hole in the roof. Now, a lot of people did studies with that, and they discovered it's better to have a, a solid roof. But when we were at our thing yesterday at, at our annual meeting, there was a guy there that deliberately puts a hole in the roof, letting in more light to deter house sparrows, but then he had glass over it, so the rain can't get in. So he's working with that, and everybody knew what he's doing and what he's trying to do and everything else, but he, he's anti-sparrow, help the bluebirds, <laughs> break out a hole in the roof. Wouldn't that heat up? I mean, wouldn't well, that? That's what people said. Right. People said about sunlight. Right. So he didn't have a response to that, but he's he's gonna. You could put it in the side. You could do that. No, yeah, it's it's interesting how, like I said, humans think they're smarter than the birds. Right? <laughs> so we're gonna figure out a way to combat the yeah. sparrows. We're gonna combat them, you know, the house friends or whatever, but. Reflected. There's another, this, this uh, slot, that, this type of, I had a personal experience with that. I had a nest box over by a little farm near my my property, and uh, I drove by there one day and I saw a sparrow sitting on top, and I said, boy, that was a sparrow, I'm sure it was. So I went home and I came back, opened it up, and naturally it was a sparrow nest. And like Jim said, you can tell because they've got wax paper and wax, anything that they can make a... Nest you could make a nicer nest than you. <laughs> so anyway, I removed it, threw it away, went back the next day, and they'd already had half a nest built. So then I'm thinking, you know what? I think I have one of these K-Box uh, doors at home. So I went and got back home and got uh, my screwdriver, took the uh, entrance hole off, put the other one on. Three days later, I had bluebirds nesting. So I think it did work for me. And I, I'm not sure if, uh, Jim, you've had that same experience, yeah. but it yeah. is interesting. Yeah. But don't be afraid to do some experimentation. And like uh, we learned yesterday was that fellow was going to try to see how that hole right in the top of the house would be. And I know it would get cold. And this time of year, if we get a rain and the nest gets wet mm. and there's babies down in there, hypothermia for sure. Yes. I had another type of wren at my house that built a very neat nest and not out of sticks. Oh, really? Really, because I thought, well, what kind of a bird is this? And I watched it, and it was a wren, and I did look it up, and I can't remember the name of it right now. But it was a cavity nesting bird. It was then. a definite. It was a wren. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Starlings. I don't, I don't. Jim mentioned starlings. They are also uh, non-native. So. Uh, they're a little bit larger, I think. So, like I said before, if our friendly woodpeckers get in there to make the hole bigger, then the starlings will probably be able to use it. So, try to keep that. Here's a dead uh, male bluebird. 
That uh, looks like his skull was crushed, so probably a sparrow did that. And a, an example of a friendly little woodpecker got in there, and uh, they typically do that later in the summer when they're ready to start thinking about winter, I guess. So. But like I say, I will remove the screws in here, and uh, it takes me five minutes, and I got to do more in there. So it's, uh, there are other people I've seen yesterday. In fact, there was a fellow that had a little metal square that he would screw right over the entrance um, where that larger hole, so that it was the same size as this. So the uh, birds and the other cavity nesters could get in there, but the woodpecker couldn't. They got to have a place to go to, don't they? And. Uh, Bra recommends that one of the beauties of this whole process is being able to monitor the nest box. And uh, I monitor mine uh, from seven to eight, nine days apart. Uh, usually write down the date, the box number. Uh, what's going on there? Is there a nest? Yes, there is a nest. Is it a bluebird nest? Yes. Uh, any eggs? No. And so then next week and so forth. At the end of the season, we recommend that you give a, a report. If, if people are interested in, uh, I've got some uh, Wisconsin Bluebird magazines. They're quarter, uh, delivered quarterly, four times a year. And uh, I think it's the best, that's, uh, the best magazine that uh, is put out in the US. I think, I think we won a couple of awards on this. The gentleman that does this is really fantastic. But I've got several here. If anybody wants to just walk over and grab one and take it, you're welcome to take them. These are older boxes, but much of the information never changes. You know, it just. Uh, but if you become a member uh, of the organization, uh, you will get that, and uh, it uh, comes every quarter. But anyway, the joys I think of going around and looking at this wildlife, seeing uh, the cycles, it's just fabulous, I think. And uh, so we recommend that, uh, uh, and my, my little students at these schools, the teachers, I found that what really works best with, uh, is if I can find a teacher that's really interested in working with the kids. Because uh, these kids just love going out there once a week. And uh, I know the teachers tell me uh, they recognize cloud formations. They recognize different trees. Now they're all looking for different kinds of birds. It just changed the whole uh, environment for them. And it's part of their science class, I guess. So. But anyway, they at the end of the school year, uh, they typically will appoint a couple, a few of the kids to take care of the nest boxes. So, anyway, it's a good program. And uh, we've, uh, a couple weeks ago, we were up at uh, Interstate Park up at St. Croix Falls, and uh, Jim, the two Jims and I, uh, we had some children there, and one of the gentlemen had cut out a bunch of uh, pieces, uh, parts of the nest box, and the children assembled the, these nest boxes. So we We've had some occasions where that works out really well too. There it is. So that's pretty much. Uh, yeah, I know you probably some of you have more questions. And we got the two gems here that can take over and uh, give us a little uh, tutorial on some of the work they do. Well, I, I, you know, you look at the nest boxes, and which is the best one? The best one is the ones you get bluebirds in. Yeah. And when you look at them, basically, there's there's three types or three styles. You have what originally started out as the NAB style, North American Bluebird Society. And it's basically your square box with a hole in it and slanted roof. Then in 1972, right around there, Ken Peterson from St. Paul developed the Peterson style box. So I started making these. And it's a little different variation, a little more complex to build it. And I, I personally like that one. And then a couple of years ago, a guy came up to me and he says, I have eight acres in town in River Falls there, it's up in development. 
And he says, I talked to the city, and they'll get up and put bluebird houses up there, but I, I need somebody to take care of them. And, oh, what do you mean you're going to put bluebirds up? You know, I says, because it's a lot of work. So I finally, I, I gave in. I, I agreed. I said, okay, we'll put the, the nest boxes up there. I'll help you, and then and I'll, I'll, I'll monitor them. I said, what, who's going to build the nest boxes? He said, oh, I, I will. I said, well, what kind are you building? He said, the Gilbertson. Well, this is my first, my first uh, introduction to the Gilbertson style box, which is basically a PVC pipe, and it's, and it's got you know, ventilation holes in it, and it's a solid bottom. There's a slot in there for let ventilation through. And it's pretty simple to build. He, he cranked these out, and we went out and put them up. So I have three bluebird trails right now. I have this one here, which is in, in the uh, development in River Falls, which is pretty much townhouses, uh, single family homes, with a large community field for the kids to play soccer and baseball and all that stuff. So a lot of short grass. So I, I think for myself, I was doing this as an experiment. So I says, I have, I have that trail with this style. I says, a friend of mine has a, a beef farm outside, out, out of town. So I put up eight of these, the, the uh, nab style boxes to see if there's any, who prefers what. And then I have out of Kelly Creek Preserve, which is basically, it's a, it's a prairie. And wild prairie, so I have I have 14 of these, and I have one of these. So I'm trying to think, okay, which which style direct you know attracts more bluebirds? And basically, they all do. I mean, because they're going to find that cavity to nest in, so it doesn't make any difference. But which is the best style? Which is the best for the birds? One thing I noticed last summer is these PVC they heat up. When the sun shines out, and you get a 95 degree day, and the sun is you know. I lost birds last year because they just cooked in here. Mm -hmm. By the time I came back, there was little birds. I come back the next week and they're all dead because it's just so hot. Another thing that, that hampered us last year early was the cold, wet weather. Some people lost birds, lost eggs. I didn't in the early season, but late in the summer we had those heavy storms, a lot of heavy rain, wind. The rain and wind got in here, soaked the little birds, soaked the nest, and then you got that 95 degree heat afterwards, and they just the heat and humidity just cooked them. So I lost a lot of birds that way. So I do like these, and uh, like you said, the Peterson style opens up. It's just a smaller square for them to build their nest. And so when you open this, the nest sit, and you can you know you monitor them fairly easy. Um, like I said, these are the way I build them, and then I, I drill two holes in here with a, a U clamp that I can clamp to the steel fence post. But then additionally, I'll take a, a four inch by three foot section of stove pipe and put on there to keep the raccoons and everything. But out at Kelly Creek, we also do programs with the middle school kids. They come out and they do ecological things and they clear brush and buckthorn and then we do a, a deck all out, you know, easy day. And they wanted to go out and look at the houses. I, so I gave them the talk about bluebirds and everything, but I said they were, at, at that time, I was ready to fledge. And I said, I really don't want to open up a house for 25 kids or 30 kids because if they jump out, now you got all these little pup balls you're trying around and catch them and put them back in there because they're not ready to go yet. So I saw an idea, so I came up with, and I built this box, and I call it the peekaboo box. Because oh. I put the plexiglass back here. So now, and even on, I can do a quick check, I can just open up the box and I can see in there, oh, there's eggs in there, there's bluebirds in there or whatever, and then the kids can look in there and you're not disturbing the birds. So I, I have one of these out there, and then this is one I, I bring along to show people. And uh, so that, and that works out pretty well. <coughs> I, uh, we, we gave the presentation at Interstate Park last year. It was our first time up there, we did it. And there was a, a young gal, she had her two sons there, and I helped her build put her, her box together, and I had these up there. And she was interested in that. Well, then I find out, I saw her up there this spring, I find out now she's a fourth grade teacher, and she says, I'm really interested in doing this. Well, she has so far built 50 of these to give her for her kids. You know, and they put them together in class. Well, but now she wants to, to build this one for her class to go and look. So we were emailing back and forth to show pictures. So she's building her own peekaboo box so she can put it for the little kids to come by and look at it. And she's telling me, she says, I hate to say this, but I think I've taken flight with this bluebird situation. So I says, you're, you're creating people that, that want to go out there and put bluebird houses up and monitor them. And I told her yesterday, I was talking to her, I said, what I typically do, I keep a notepad and I go around, I monitor each box. And then when the birds fledge, if it's a bluebird, I have a blue marker pen, I'll just mark blue on it, so it's a bluebird. You know, four bluebirds, five bluebirds. If it's a wren, and I use red for it's a wren, or if it's tree swallows, use green. So at the end of the season, I can just go through my notes. So 
bluebirds all blue, five, six, seven, eight, you know, whatever it is. And then it, it's easy for me to tally them up. But uh, what, what we learned yesterday in, in this large group of people, we are all there with the same purpose, same focus. And I says, it's almost like every time there's a nest in here, that's our children. And we want them all to grow and be healthy and happy and warm and well-fed and go off into the world. And when you lose one, you feel bad. So last year out at the farm in one of these, I got pictures on my phone. I come to check them. There's 12 eggs in here from tree swallows. 12 tree swallow eggs. And I'm thinking, my gosh, there's not going to be enough room in there. You put 12, you know. So I'm thinking, okay, the next week I go out there, I'm going to have to build another box and put it next to it and, and separate them up. Now, I don't know who's who, but they're going to, you know, come to separate them up. <laughs> but then I come back, I think it was a week or two later, because I was at vacation, whatever, and I come back, now there's 12 babies in there. Okay. Okay, now I got to go back. I do have to build a house and separate them, but I come back the next time, and the parents have abandoned them because they were just so overwhelmed. It was just too many mouths to feed. Oh. And then with the heat and everything, and I don't know if there was a lack of bugs or whatever. So sad thing is, and I wasn't the only one. Another girl in our, and lady in our uh, bird club had the same situation. She had 12 eggs and lost them all too. And even though she separated them. So um, you do find those heartbreaks. But then at the end of the season, when you tally up, ha, I fledged 100, you know, or 95 birds or 90 you know, bluebirds. And it, and it gives you a good feeling. So uh, it's a hobby that... It, it gives you a lot of satisfaction. You know, you're out there every week. I monitor mine every week, um, and, and that's part of my my day to walk. And I, like I said, I have three bluebird trails, and they all cover about 80 acres. So each mm. each walk probably is about 35 to 45 minutes. And if I take my time, like Kelly Creek, there's a natural spring there, so there's a bench we can sit on. I always bring a lunch or a snack after I get done, but. Um, it's just nice to be out, and, and you mm -hmm. not only see bluebirds, you see a lot of other different wildlife and stuff too. So it's it's always uh, always fun. One thing I failed to mention was when we were talking a little bit about spacing. Uh, also, where where do you want to point the nest box? And uh, we all know the sun comes up in the east, so we recommend you put your nest box so that's facing the east, mainly because in the early year it gets pretty cool at night. And I realize, uh, and with cedar, cedar is an insulator. Wood is an insulator, not a conductor. So we want to make our nest boxes using wood. But if we do point it to the east, that fortunately, once in a while, the sun does shine. When it does shine, you'll get a little bit of sun in there. It helps keep it uh, a little warmer in there. And you'll notice how the roof is sloped so the rain can kind of go down. I always put a little sock crop right across the nest box on the roof so that it extends a little bit past the vertical here. And when the if there is rain that falls over, that sock earth would make it drop straight down. And also, most of our thunderstorms in the summer come from the southwest, southwest don't they? So if we're pointing east, obviously you're not going to get that rain as often driving into the nest box. And so those are a couple of things that you know you may want to consider if you do. And it's a lot of fun to do. They're easy to build. Um, we have a website, B R A W. If you key on that, you will get box plans, uh, or even just look for Bluebird box plans on the internet. You will get more doggone plans than you know what to do with. And like we said, uh, all boxes are pretty good. Some are a little better. Uh, this Joe O'Heller and gentleman that we talked about. Through his statistics, he found that uh, because he required that we send in the type of nest box that we were that we have, he determined that bluebirds tend to prefer a little bit smaller cavity. And I know the Petersons tend to be a little bit bigger. Very good box. I've got 29 of them at Little, uh, little River, and they get the birds in there. But he said that if we have a choice, he thinks that the bluebirds prefer a little bit smaller nest box. I've actually tried to see if that, in fact, is the case. I've put Petersons out, and I've put, uh, this one here is like the naps, a little bit different, but very similar. And the reason these are easier to build is because there's not as many angles. That uh, Peterson box takes more wood. It's, uh, 
and uh, it's a, maybe a little heavier too. So anyway, I use uh, the T posts, the ones that we saw on the slide, because they are very rigid. The wind isn't going to affect them. Uh, I know some people put uh, the uh, rebar, the reinforcing bar. That tends, especially if you've got a heavy box and get a wind, it's going to. And like this tile here, what you do is you take a, a two foot piece of half inch rebar, mm -hmm. pound that into right the in ground, there. then this conduit slips over it. And then you take a self-tapping screw to put in there so it doesn't turn. Then also on the top, then this here would just sit on the top of that, and you would put a screw in there to hold it solid facing east so the wind wouldn't. Because right now I got a couple, this guy installed them, but a couple of them, they'll, they'll swing in the east and in the, in the wind, so I got to go back there and arrange them. So now when I go back out there this spring now, I got to reattach all those to make them sure they all, all point right to the east. And Jim, as he said, it's very, very disappointing when you walk into a nest box and you find the dead babies or something. Yeah. And you say, oh, no. You it's know. like, what did I do wrong? Yeah. What, what could I have done better? Yeah. I always say, part of Mother Nature. Yeah. Yes. yes. Here in the park, we ended up with a territorial robin that will sit on one of the nest boxes. Anything that we can do about that? <laughs> Do they, do, which is a bluebird box? Yeah. Do bluebirds, yep. uh, you, will they use it when the robin is around or not? They're not quite as um, aggressive to likely to use it, it seems like anyways. But that started, I think, last year. Huh. So we have a bunch of different issues that we have to deal with. But yeah, robins that are was not, the one that kind of perplexed yeah. me the most. Robins are not cavity nesters, so that's kind of surprising. That they yeah, it just there. decided that it liked to sit on the top of like one particular nest box and it wasn't going to be moved. I don't know if there's a, you can try to move it a little bit, uh, just get it away to a, a different location. Different location. You know. You've heard the term, you know, I'm a lover, not a fighter. All bluebirds are lovers, they're not fighters. If we could just do something to make them a little more aggressive to kick <laughs> the other ones out, to be, but they, they're very passive, and when they're in their nest, they'll sit, like the mother will sit right on her nest and protect it while she's being killed by another oh. bird. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard part that, you know, that you have to deal with. But they're, they're, they're protective, but they're not fighters. That's why we like them, I guess. I just want to mention this predator guard for cats and raccoons at uh, Noel, was a guy who's yeah. was, that you make out of hardware cloth and you can staple that to your front door. And there's points on it and cats and raccoons that they'd have a hard time reaching through there. So oh. some people have this on all their houses. Right on the and house. Works. And they work. For bluebirds? Well, this one yesterday claimed that he'd never had a raccoon. And a bluebird to walk on there and go right in. Oh. oh, that's on the outside. Yeah, okay. it's on the outside. Yes, ma'am. Well, most people just have that uh, PVC. PVC pipe around them, so they can't climb put, up there. Excuse me. My sure. husband put something like that on the bottom of the inside of the boxes, so if there's fly larva or anything, oh, yeah. it will fall down under that and it can't get back up. There was a person that mentioned that yesterday, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact. Yep, kept a space underneath there. Right. Yeah. He's ahead of the game. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> well, I guess uh, any other questions, uh, Jessica? I guess that's all I've got. I have one. Oh, oh, keep the box clean. Go ahead. Could you say a couple oh, words about chickadees? I, are they their cavity nest? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, where's my. Chickadees? I get chickadees. Chickadees. Chickadees make their nest out of uh, moss. So if you should happen to find a nest box, and they're a little earlier than most of the other birds, actually. Chickadees are among the earliest uh, nesters. And they will line uh, their nest box with moss. Mm -hmm. And uh, as soon as I recognize that we have a chickadee nest, I have a little uh, square piece of uh, plywood with two screws. And I'll put it right over the entrance hole and it's about a little over an inch in diameter. This is an inch and a half, and I, uh, the chickadee one, I make about an inch and a half, and I'll screw right over the top. The chickadee can get in, but the other birds can't. Otherwise, they'll kick the chickadees out. And everybody loves chickadees. And as uh, soon as the chickadee fledges, then I take the plug out, and then the bluebirds come in. So the chickadees will use the same box. They are, they are cavity nesters. Do you actually make the whole house small? Nope, just the entrance hole. Just the, the entrance hole. Yeah. It's smaller. Yep, yeah. an inch and an eighth about. Yep. Yeah. I've got, uh, there's some handouts here, a whole bunch of uh, 
you can come on over. I've got many different kinds of birds and what the recommended sizes are for them. So last year, last year when I was Chinese. checking this houses in town, I pulled this down, looked in that, and I thought, first of all, I thought tree swallow, and I thought, what, what, what made that nest? And it was grass, but then there was a lot of dog hair, and you know, I thought, I couldn't figure out what it was. And I thought, well, I'm gonna have to leave it and see what it is. And I come back the next week, and there was eight chickadee eggs in there. And so I, you know, then the third week I come back, you pop it down, and, and with, problem with these, and I, I don't want to say it's a problem, but you could take this off to look at it because you got to take it down to check on it. A lot of times the mom bird is sitting in there, she'll just let, she'll just sit there and watch you, you know, do whatever you're on top of. Well, you can't take her out and see how many eggs are underneath her, but then you just click it back up. But she was sitting in there, and uh, so they had fledged eight, eight babies out of this, so there was plenty of room. When you figure eight of them in there, that's a lot of a lot of moles to feed. You know, I've had several chickadees nesting, and then the bluebirds, bluebirds will come in and take them out too. They'll, so that's why I made that little spar hole, put it, two screws on there, it takes a couple minutes, and and then when uh, they fledge, then just remove it, and the bluebirds come mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. You talked about separating when there were too many. Would the would the mother feed? Oh, sure. Both. Because we've, we've all had the problem where you have eggs that are abandoned or yeah. you know something, maybe predation or something happened to one of the parents or both parents and you have babies that are left there. Um, if you have another nest box down the road someplace that has babies in it, they're close to the same, same age. size, yeah. same age, yeah. you can take those, carry them down there, put them in, they'll them. and they'll they'll oh, take them on. It's just like, you know, well, oh, you're part of the family, you're here yeah, for supper today, okay, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. We've had people report that. The most eggs I've ever had in any of my boxes is seven. I don't know. I've eight, had six. Six? Yep. Five is the most I get. Yeah. I had one that had seven eggs that they laid. And she they would fledge seven. Once I always feel once I can get those eggs hatched, where they're starting to feed, I think I can fledge them all. But the danger is before they reach... Uh, the hatching stage, the tree swallows come in, the house wrens will come in with that nice little beak they got, they'll poke holes in them, throw the eggs out, and then they take over the house. Yes, ma'am? How many times did you see, like, the birds fledge? How many times have I seen them fledge? Well, I've been doing this for about 27 years. Mm -hmm. Right now I've got about 60 nest boxes. So I've seen several thousand bluebirds become adults. And other birds too, but mainly bluebirds. Um, I've had, uh, I think the Bluebird Association back, I'm gonna say three years ago, with the reports that came in from all the people that are monitoring nest boxes, Wisconsin <laughs> fledged 32,000 bluebirds. Last year, which was a very cold spring, remember we had some really nasty cold weather in June last year? The count is down to 23,000 last year, but still the number one state. He had beat Nebraska last year. My neighbor lady a couple of years ago came to me because she had bluebird eggs in her nest and all of a sudden they disappeared and she couldn't figure out why. And so I went over and I opened the nest. I said, I think I know what happened and I lifted some of the grass off. It wasn't really grass, it was a lot of other stuff too. And the sparrow had nested right over the top of the bluebird eggs. That's what they do. How often do starlings nest? Starling? Yeah, because you said they compete for the space too. Yeah, I I don't have starlings in my place. I, I've never seen a starling. I've seen sparrows, but I what, uh, what I've done with the sparrows, when I recognize I've got sparrows in there, take a plastic bag, rip it right over, and I grab a hold of it, have a big enough plastic bag, I can open it up. And they fly out. So now i got them in the plastic bag. That's where I want them. <laughs> because they don't stay in there too long. But uh, it's very cool. Let's face it, it's cool. Where do bluebirds nest, or where do they uh, uh, winter? Well, uh, they say they'll winter, they'll go as far south as they have to go to get food. Southern Wisconsin has a lot of birds that will stay over winter. 
I don't know about this year because they've had a kind of a tough winter down yeah. that way too. I've had, uh, like I said, I had that one situation where I had five bluebirds up on a wire. Uh, my neighbor, he's seen uh, bluebirds uh, in January a couple of different times. He said. So yes. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing all of your amazing experience and your passion for this with us. We really appreciate it. We do have treats over here. So if you guys can hang out a little bit longer, sure. please, um, you know, have more questions if you have them. Please have some treats. We also have an art exhibit opening reception for Mr. Tom Blank, who's right here, and BJ Christofferson, and there's room for everybody. So please join us. Please stick around. And thank you again. Let's give him a wonderful round of applause.